Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking with someone who's going to be telling us about a wonderful movement that he has going on. And when it comes to movements, it's something that he's been doing over the course of a lifetime. His name is simply synonymous with the folk music era, especially in 60s activism with the rock group Peter, Paul, and Mary. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program, I'd like to welcome our guest, Mr. Peter Yarrow of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Peter, thank you for joining us here on the program today. I'm delighted to be joining you. This is a first for me. How long have you been here? It's, um, it's surprising that we haven't spoken before. Well, you know, that we're speaking now is a good start. <laughs> now, I'm, you know, I grew up I, uh, as a young child, and, and, of course, one of the big songs a lot of people really identify the group uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary with is Puff the Magic Dragon. And the simplicity of being able to sing such a wonderful song, you know, with such a great story, you know, really permeates what you and Paul and Mary were really about as far as your music and who you were in creating this all together. Well, Puff the Magic Dragon was one aspect of Peter Paul and Mary's singing that um, people frequently think of us as being. Uh, primarily is with songs like If I Had a Hammer and Blowing in the Wind, and certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, it comes in many other songs that had very direct relations, movements uh, that we were supporting and in which we were involved. But there were, there was a whole other series of songs that uh, were a picture of what folk music was about and how it affected us, some of them being songs, some of them being about ballads of historical significance or intent that celebrated events in the lives of people years ago. And um, one of the areas that was really important to us right from the beginning was the area of songs, uh, children's songs. In the first album we did, this, It's Raining, Pouring, and Autumn to May, and in the second album, we did um, we did uh, Puff the Magic Draft that was uh, really uh, turned out to be and it's hugely hugely successful. Uh, it never occurred to any of us uh, that would that would take place. It would become uh, you know a huge hit, but it it it, it hit note I think and. And people that appeal to their their sense of of of, of a kind of a vulnerability and a longing for a kind of of innocence that we have when we are children. I mean, I think that in all of the children, there's a delight that we have as adults in that kind of whimsy and that kind of innocence and, and fun that's inherent in the lives of children, of us when we were children. So <clears throat> that became song in its, uh, in its evolution became identified not just with that feeling of innocence, but of a, became identified with an era in which people were filled with idealism and hope and and belief that we were going to march towards a more a fair, better world. And when it is sung now for many people, it's not only the feeling that the song itself has about children, but all about that era that had such an impact on the of their lives. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I just remember growing up, I was born in 1964, and I do remember in uh, 1970, uh, my stepfather going off to the Vietnam War and uh, the music that surrounded at least our household at the time. You know, your albums were being played. Uh, we had also Joan Baez as well. You had Graham Steele's Nash & Young. And th this was the music that I grew up with. And at the same time, growing up in Southern California, 
it's something that you could also sense and feel at the same time that there was a lot of hope, but at the same time there was turmoil pushing against that. And, you know, of course, as a child, you take a look at these uh, things and you say to yourself, well, why? I don't get it why the world can't just simply play. Well, that's that's true. And that's what we need when we grow up to um, go into a, a sense of responsibility by doing something to bring us closer to that shit because we inherit a very imperfect world and always will. And our task in our lives is to be in the side of, of moving us forward and hopefully uh, in the sense that, you know, the world was uh, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago a barbaric world which um, uh, People anticipated the possibility of being um, destroyed by the unbridled forces that that surrounded them in in common ways, from simply the feudal system or through uh, the kinds of wars that were fought when armies would sweep across from Asia through Europe, etc. An era when the Crusades existed. Uh, I mean, barbarism, craziness. But and now we have come to a time that is uh, far, far less dangerous to people, where there's ability, or in certain countries over long periods of time. But uh, we are we are threatened by more uh, more comprehensive devastation because the tools of destruction now, such as nuclear weaponry, could really uh, destroy the whole world and was threatened also by the de- decline of the environment that could uh, destroy the way of life for, for instance, my daughter in such a sense that it didn't, uh, it wasn't even a radar as a concern in years past. So we We've gone forward in some ways, and other ways it's a more dangerous time. I think that uh, Puff the Magic Dragon is, um, kind of a, in its own way, a, a emblematic of a desire to to try and bring us to a, a greater degree of sanity. That's why it, to me, didn't seem incongruous to sing Puff the Magic Dragon at Occupy Wall Street or Occupy D.C. or Occupy, uh, you know, uh, where there is the sense that we are living in precipitous ways and we must do what we can to halt this march towards a more a very frightening apparition of the destruction of the things we care about. And I don't think people fully have understood yet what the significance of Occupy Wall Street or Occupy Movement is. Indeed, I'm not even sure if they know where it will go or or might go. But I, uh, I do believe that the idea that people say, we, we can't just live life and let things happen. We have to get on board and do what we can individually to try and create a fairer, more just uh, society in which the possibilities of destruction are diminished. Mm -hmm. You know, it brings up something that just occurred to me. I remember as I was in the fifth grade, I happened to be a student of a teacher who was a major of World War II. And a uh, really wonderful teacher, probably one of the big influences on my life when it came to hope, at least for myself. Like, you know, I wasn't the trouble kid that I tended to be in the grades before going to the office all the time, but, you know, that there was hope for me, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, not that school didn't tend to be boring from time to time, but <clears throat> I remember that he had said one time that whenever you point your finger out towards something that you believe 
is the cause of your woes, your troubles, in other words, and blame, always remember that you have three fingers pointing back at you. We tend to live in a world sometimes where you see almost too much of that. And you say to yourself, as you're pointing out to the world the result of your woes and your troubles, what responsibility are you personally taking to change that, not just for yourself but for other people as well? Right. Well, therein lies the key to activism, and it is not an activism that belongs to young people alone. We have been active over the years. Um, oh, it, by example, say we have not lost faith, we have not lost commitment. I mean, we shouldn't manufacture something that doesn't exist inside ourselves, but we have a moral and an ethical responsibility particularly if we have a, a platform from which we can be heard, which is, um, it's possible for everybody on some level, but and for those people who have been fortunate enough to get a public voice in place, such as Peter, Paul, and Mary, and I being one of them, this is, this is really, um, I wake up in the morning saying, I I. I have a responsibility here. Mm-hmm. I have to, I have to voice my my feelings. I have to get on the program with you, for instance, and say we have to look at this time. Do we have to, for instance, we have to make sure that democracy is secure, that business interests that are now inherent and legally able to elect people who are then beholden to them, that that interferes with the proper function of democracy in very serious ways. And we've got to stop that. And what, you know, we have to say, uh, look at these things and say, how do we do that? And the most important thing to remember is that in the moment, history, nothing has been achieved through domination and 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 powerful hurting of somebody in some way it has been achieved through um, inspiration and love and um, this is the way of uh, successful advocacy historically and is um, and should be the, the way of it in the future mm-hmm. you know being someone who was an activist during you know the civil rights movement you marched with Dr. Martin Luther King um for crying out loud, there you were, the March on Washington, um, you know, anti-Civil War, excuse me, anti-Vietnam War. I mean, you've been involved, and even just recently, uh, this March on Wall Street where, as I understand, you were even doing sing-ins as well. Do you see a difference in the tone, or is there, in fact, a change in the activism where there seems more hope and possibility now than there might have seemed like then? I mean, we have the ability to text message immediately what's going on in certain areas. You you just can't hide that anymore. The media just can't, you know, black out areas and act as though it doesn't exist. It isn't controlled as easily anymore. Does it seem more hopeful nowadays than perhaps maybe it seemed then, or does it seem the same? Oh, well, it seems more hopeful then in some ways and more hopeful now. Then there was the possibility of igniting people's hearts and commitments through a common um, system of communication that allowed, for instance, radio to play songs like Blowing in the Wind and If I Had a Hammer and Everybody Knew Them. And we don't have that now. I mean, just tell me, what is the we shall overcome of today's efforts? It uh, doesn't exist. Of course it exists. It's out there. But we've heard it because that's not what the radio is playing in. Now, on the other hand, the communicant to the net allowed people to know not just strategically what to do in terms of their efforts in the Arabs, but also to know that there were others out there who were fed to the same purpose and that communication in the net is not only what is allowing a lot of these uh, spring movements, and I look at Occupy Wall Street or Occupy Movement, 
as being an American spring of sorts. It also will be the place where you will see the heartfelt messages of commitment being shared because they're not being shared in in the commercial uh, TV or or audio venues uh, where uh, well I can't say radio but I can I can say music radio you sure. know mm -hmm. um, uh, you know it's just, you're just not going to hear that kind of music that's playing the We Shall Over the Moon today in in broad blanketing of the nation so that everybody knows that song or knows where have all the flowers gone or those songs that were so prominent movements before. So it's hopeful in the sense that we are getting to the place where the communication through the net is going to be a, a very powerful, more and more powerful and effective tool for collaborative efforts to make sense of the world um, as it's struggling, you know. I mean, this is this is a, uh, a do or die time. The, the wages of failure are extreme. Couldn't agree with you more. I know that, you know, over the years as I've broadcasted radio um, and, and I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, many great activists and musicians um, that, you know, a looming question always began to surface and, and it seems like the news about the state of world affairs almost loops itself. It seems to just repeat itself and I keep you know, thinking, are we ever going to get the lesson? You know, we hear about peace, we see movements and activ uh, uh, activists, you know, for peace. Uh, we see a lot of solutions out there, you know, world hunger, uh, being able to stay in disease, uh, you know, showing, uh, you know, how we can build better communities, how we can all support each other. And, and, you, and you just can't help but say, why do we keep being in the same ridiculous loop, why it keeps repeating itself? And then you have leaders, once you spotlight them, say, well, you know, that's, it just isn't existing, as though, you know, well, it's right here in front of us. You know, what is it that you're doing that perpetuates this to continuously happen when we really all feel inside of ourselves we just want to move a di different direction, that we all want to be loved? We all want to be respected. Well, let's, we let's, certainly want to be appreciated. That's inside of ourselves. That's inside of ourselves. But the real, the, the real root of a lot of the problem is um, greed. And, and greed didn't exist unless people looked upon uh, material wealth as being um, happiness and power which after a certain point it's not. I mean, you just when you have enough, you're not struggling to survive and you can have um, enough to eat and a home over your head and you can have a, you know, a medical care and et cetera. You're, you're, you can have as much happiness in the world, but the accumulation of more wealth is, is a waste. And people who are in hospice are not wearing their jewels. I sing, you know, in hospice. I'm a big advocate for it. I'll tell you, you know, if, if people were to act with a mindfulness that what is really important, prior to that period of time, there would be uh, a, a really effective, caring, national an international place of being, but what has interfered with that and continues to interfere with that is the uh, reality of uh, of greed that has taken hold of us, and and the in the inequity of of wealth mm -hmm. has a really really as long as there is that kind of inequity or injustice you're going to see uh, the force propelling us towards um, towards um, not only societal dislocation, but war. Mm -hmm. If you want to stop war, you, you have to create equity in countries like um, Egypt. I mean, 
people have to have a mutual stake in making society work. And if people are desperate and hungry and poor, they can be mobilized in hatred, and therein you create the conditions of war. So we, if we want to build a society where it's safer, uh, we, uh, we have to create greater equity, and we have to stop the, uh, the intrusion of greed as it uh, really becomes more and more a dominant factor in determining what kind of society we're living in. Now, I know that over the years, that as you've been involved in activism, that you've also received your number of death threats. It seems there's always a threat when somebody's moving in a direction that seems peaceful, that threatens somebody who perhaps doesn't want this. And I kind of liken that back to the days that probably all of us have either experienced directly or witnessed directly or even experienced indirectly that of playground bullying. I had the opportunity to go on to YouTube where there's a wonderful video of you singing with about two, 200, 200 plus students, Puff the Magic Dragon. And, uh, you know, this was an appearance that you made at the Reading Bug, uh, which was in San Carlos. And, you know, this is part of an activism that I know or I understand you've been involved with for a while, which is to stop bullying. I mean, that starts at a very young age, so you can almost see where the perpetuation of violence can actually start at such a young age to where somebody, you know, a student says, you know, I just don't belong in school anymore. I don't feel accepted by my peer groups. I'm lost. I'm confused. And someone comes along just like a terrorist uh, sort of a, a recruitment and says, well, we understand you. Come and be part of our cause. And before you know it, you're, you're almost done. Tell us about this performance well, that you had at the Reading Bug. Well, the performance of the Reading Bug actually was a, um, something that I do all the time. And it, to promote, ostensibly, it's like doing concerts with Peter, Paul, and Mary, except instead of going of all, it's at the Reading Bug. And what happens are, are many, many, many uh, bookstores like them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the Reading Bug. And I'm there. And there are many people who have books out, as I have, uh, and promoting this new version of Puff Books that was put out about three and a half years ago that became wildly successful and was a, an illustrated book of The Magic Dragon with a CD with my daughter and me singing on it and a couple of other songs. And... It was wonderful because, you know, um, I can't tell you if there's another activist folk singer that's had been able to sell a million things in the past <laughs> couple of decades. But here I am, 73 years old, and saying, wow, this is amazing. And so I, uh, you know, to promote this, I, I, I go out of it, but they're just signing on a graph. I think, and it's like a cross between, I used to say between a, a, a march, you know, a, a march on Washington, a concert hall, and 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 a, a family gathering. And now I could say it's a cross between those things and Occupy Reading Bug or Occupy whatever, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden you are just all together with hearts linked saying we've got to you know, do what we can to love each other in a better world. Well, the the <clears throat> this is this is to me as important and meaningful as anything that I've ever done, even though the scale is very very tiny, because it just it's it's hand made. It's 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 like get a hug or giving a hug to your child or your grandchild. It's it's a building block of joy in life. And when those kids all sing together, and in this case, promoting the uh, the, the pop-up book of Puff the Magic Dragon, which is 
extraordinary new level of experience. Mm-hmm. It, it's just remarkable, I have to say. An extraordinary job by the paper engineer, uh, whose his name is Bruce uh, Foster, who did the uh, Harry Potter book, too. But this one is different in that it's not much extraordinary scenery, but also interactive, you know, mm-hmm. where kids can play, with and, and their grandparents, too. And, and as you open the page, the Jolly Roger goes down for the pirate ships lowering their flag, and the pirate extends his hand, and there's jacket paper on a rope swung by Puff the Magic Dragon as he as he uh, goes into the uh, to the to the lake where they're playing. Well, when I do this, it links not just to the idea of creating a little world for a little time. Kids are singing together and and accepting each other and not pushing the other away. It stops the building of, as you suggested, uh, towards war. Mm-hmm. It's called the Pyramid League, and the Anti-Defamation League described it in this way. It says it starts with uh, bullying and teasing and pushing you away uh, when you're children, and then builds to bias, hatred, racism. Then it builds to war, and then Holocaust. So if we want to stop it, from the evolving, we have to build that kind of trust, that kind of that kind of acceptance among children. Now, my my work, my main work now is through Operation Respect, which has a program which is in 2,000 schools in the United States and all over the world in in, in um, Israel, in Arabic, as well as in Hebrew, in um, uh, in uh, in Ukraine, working with the Peace Corps and the U.S. Embassy supporting it, we're in, in, in South Africa, Croatia, Hong Kong. And, but there's a, a program called Don't Laugh at Me. If you go, if you're an educator or um, an, an involved parent working with children or a, a school psychologist or a, a school counselor or an administrator or law enforcement person working with kids to help them through difficult times, you go to operationrespect.org, which is www.operationrespect.org. You can download this free program, and you can, there are other, it has curricula that was uh, devised by Educators for Social Responsibility, and then infused with music, and you can download over 50 songs that are really wonderful to play, not for kids, but allow kids to sing themselves. First, you let them sing along with it, uh, and then they just sing by themselves. And and when you're singing with somebody and you're a child, you're not likely to turn to them after you finish the song and say, well, I don't like you. You're the wrong religion or the wrong color. (laughs) So in that way... This work is really connected to the same work as the civil rights movement and the other work, uh, efforts of which I've been a part through my life. It is creating an environment of respect and caring, this time in the educational arenas or places where children congregate, such as bookstores, and it uses, instead of just a CD, if I put out this CD, it would have sold 50 copies. But the, this CD and the book sold over a million copies, and the new version will sell lots and lots. And this is there's another vehicle, by the way, that we're using, which is an app, which is a new concept. But here we have an app for Pup the Magic Dragon, which you get just by going to the App Store or the market, as they call it, and you download it on your iPad or your um, Smartphone, whether it's a an iPhone or a, an Android, and you can sit there like it's you're a child, or if you're a child, and just be enchanted by the most extraordinary uh, kind of interactive uh, exchange with it, where you press 
on, on a screen and something happens so that the the the, the fans in Puff the Magic Dragon uh, where you see Jackie Paper with his uh, his fancy stuff, his healing wax and string, you know, and you press on it and they go and they go all around the page or you press on it and uh, other things occur that animate the flowers bloom, the 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 the, the, the sky, the sun moves in the sky, and it's all charming and it's interactive, and you create a little drama, and it's at their discretion. It's really quite remarkable, and it's a complementary piece to this new uh, pop-up book that um, that just was released. That I have to say was. It, it makes me really proud to see how beautifully it was created. It's pretty exciting to see that you start your career, you know, with just uh, musical instruments and, and songs, and then you see it evolve to pop-up books and applications for cell phones. <laughs> it must be very exciting for you. It's very it's exciting. I prefer high-touch to high-tech, but if you could combine them, Right. As you do with the book, the kids have a dog-eared copy of a book they love after a while. And they also have the app, which is a continuous source of delight as they play on their high-tech tools that are becoming more and more commonplace. Then you have the best of all worlds. But what it doesn't do, fortunately, is take kids away from a sense of of goodness and caring and, and unanimity of spirit. And I, when I know that that's the case and I feel it at the bleeding bug where we're all singing together and then it turns out that the, well, the owners and creators of this store is a beautiful singer and I always find somebody to come and sing with me and then I bring the kids up and they sing. Mm-hmm. And they know the words to Puff, even at three years old. Oh, yeah. How old are you, I say? And he says, free. I say, you're free? Free at last? Come and sing Puff. And this little girl or this little boy sing it, whether they're three or five or seven or nine, or it's their parents or grandparents. It's extraordinary to see how everybody uh, knows that song. And I can more grateful. You know, I'm reminded as I was growing up that I had the wonderful opportunities to go to campouts where, you know, it could be with the boys' club for a week up in the mountains of San Bernardino or whether it was with another organization where it was, you know, four or five days. And there was always that that ending note of the campfire. And then there was the stories and eventually the songs. And you couldn't think of yourself if there's a greater place that I would rather be than right here, right now, enjoying this. And in that moment, it was the reason I feel that we all felt together, that we were all equal, we were all enjoying ourselves, and we had that mystical experience of the fire with the night surrounding us. And I can see how, as you go out and you perform, especially at places like the Bug, that you, that, that opportunity surrounds us even in the light that we all have that feeling of being able to express ourselves, to be heard, but most importantly, to belong and to be appreciated. And you can see that even bullies would be washed away in the love and the acceptance of something like that where they would no longer have to fear, which is part of the reason they bully in the first place. You're you're absolutely right. I mean, this is uh, bullying to a large degree exists because of uh, an example set by adults where there is all an inequity of power. Mm-hmm. There's, when, when whites were dominant over black or where they still are, there is an equation of inequity of power that it invites, encourages, and fosters bullying. When kids have, some kids have, are physically strong mothers, Mm -hmm. or when men are strong and can intimidate women, you see bullying going on. 
and you see that it's, it exists every level. So if you want to eliminate bullying, for instance, the kind of bullying that I believe the United States got into in terms of its foreign policy historically, where big strength it was, um, you know, it, it, you call other nations when they know that they are publicly humiliated by the United States, saying, uh, you know, uh, calling them out in certain ways. They, they, if we understand, for instance, how China functions, or how the United States is being uh, labeled. Uh, Iran, the axis of evil, actually exacerbated the problem and made them like a human being who's humiliated. And instead of, uh, you know, folding their tents and going away, you know, they, it just created a circumstance for greater danger, for greater um, violence, and um, and and. And, and actions that that became dangerous to us. So the exacerbation of terrorism, uh, of, of 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 the kind of of real real danger in the world comes from approaching a conflict in a um, in the perspective of saying we're going to overcome this situation by dominating and destroying the adversary. And if Russia couldn't do it with Chechnya, because it just re-emerges, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody can do it to any any country or any people. It's just not going to happen. The anger will intensify, and over the generations there will be retribution. The only way to get rid of that equation, to approach the dilemmas of the world with an understanding that we really have very little alternative to finding ways of resolving conflict uh, nonviolently. Because, as it turns out now, the economic of, of war and destruction are such that what it, it used to take a, a nation of equal power and money to threaten a large nation. Now, it only takes, you know, uh, you know, a few million dollars to create a weapon that can uh, uh, totally demoralize the country. I mean, we didn't, it didn't, we didn't need to be invaded by a country, and we never were invaded, to have 9-11. Mm-hmm. And I saw this coming, uh, and there will come a time when we will say, we've got to deal with problems differently because the technology of drones, for example, or such, is such that we'll have a on our hands a problem with having, you know, anybody, the president, let alone members of Congress, out of doors and potentially being struck by a drone attack, because uh, and we would have to have a shield. I mean, everybody walking in enclosed in a bubble at a stadium, unless, if everybody can kill everybody else, mm-hmm. or anybody can kill anybody else, in that situation, we are moving in that direction, although it's, you know, it's, it's a long way from that, when a, a, a little group of hating uh, people can acquire the technology to intimidate and interfere with the lives of others. It's just happened with this terrible bombing that, uh, in Afghanistan that came across from Pakistan. Here, basically, Shiites and Sunnis have been living together in you know, uh, relative peace. All of a sudden, these bombs go off, you know, and it comes from Pakistan. It didn't take a country to do that. It just took... A, a small group of people that had the technology and and absolutely intimidates and frightens the entire nation. Now, once that exists, you have to say, then how are we going to deal with it? Well, the same way you would if everybody, if you were to give everybody in the room 
a knife, let's say. Okay, now you all have a knife. You can all stab each other, and you can all kill each other. Shall we go at it, or shall we figure out a way to give everybody uh, enough so they won't have an equity that will cause this kind of behavior? So, in a sense, we are rushing pell-mell towards the time where everybody will have access to not a lot of money the, uh, to the ability to to intimidate or destabilize a nation. So how are we going to deal with that? Uh, we could either become the most horrific Orwellian police state in the world, and in that, doing that, you you put power in the hands of a few, and an ideal I, idea like communism was hypothetically something that could have been wonderful, but it turned into a horror show because put that power into the hands of somebody like Stalin and they come along and you've got uh, quite the opposite. And that is true throughout many of the nations of the world. Uh, and, you know, you saw that in Libya. And, and so you're saying, well, what can we do? This is looking way down the line and saying, where is it going? That I look at in a short sighted way at what we're dealing with. It's going to come up with solutions that might not really um, be applicable to the real dilemmas we're going to be facing. It is not in our interests to let the, the, the environment of the planet uh, deteriorate the way they are, uh, uh, the way it is, in such uh, critical ways. If we allow this to continue and we don't care about the future, then it's like greed of this generation not appreciating the natural rights of this generation to have a, an environment that works, that's viable, that's sustainable. And what happens is if we don't address that, there will be massive people who are in desperation. And the massive people who are in desperation will be trying whatever it takes to get what, what they need to survive. Mm -hmm. And that could create the kind of chaos that is Orwellian in its uh, implications. I can certainly know, Peter, that uh, I feel very encouraged, and I think that a lot of the youth, and especially uh, most people, are feeling encouraged that, you know, it's not going to be easy. It never usually is, but anything that takes work and effort is always worth doing because it helps transform your perception, the way you see the world. But I remember, uh, as this quote has been thrown around quite often, as Gandhi says, be the change that you wish to see. I don't know if there was this particular quote, but if there isn't, then I'll attribute it to you. Be the inspiration that you wish to experience. Uh, yes, it's not attributed to me. It's commonly explained as the live dream that you hope to create. If you cannot do it simply by saying, then do it, and we will make the forces out there that have control do it. That's what the Occupy movement is saying, is saying we cannot rely on the forces out there to create the world that we want. We have to live it ourselves, each person in our own way. And that is the way to create a real movement. And that's the way the civil rights movement evolved and how uh, the reason that it was successful. That's, and it, it was a people's movement. It was, did not emanate from the top down. It came from the, 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 the grassroots people involved in such a way that it was universally people take steps in their own lives mm -hmm. to live the thought of what it, to not be racist, to not relegate people of color to not only second class citizenship in America, but to being potentially the targets of, of racist, racist attacks or, uh, or pursuit by a lynch mob. And that, uh, that 
incorporation of that point of view into our life, into our culture, into the media, uh, had miraculous changes. And the United States is unique that way in the sense that it is able to really grow when it decides it can do so. And that is what the cry of Akili is. We must flex that brilliant muscle that we have. And we still have it. And uh, it, that cry is not yet articulated with specificity, but you can feel what it's asking for. And I, uh, when I participate in the Occupy efforts, I feel it all around me. It feels just like the civil rights movement. It feels just like the time when everybody said, we are not going to be still. Eastern is going to take responsibility in his or her own way for trying to bring us to a more caring, more fair, more equitable, more loving period of time. And we are doing it by living it together in this context. And we'll see where it goes as we enter the, the ongoing stream of events that makes the nation as, as to what policies are. Peter Yarrow with us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Peter, could you please give us a website if you have one where people can find out more about this and how they can get involved? Well, uh, for Operation Respect, which is my main work, uh, Operation the Respect Education okay. Initiative, the OperationRespect.org. And that's where you could get 50 songs that are free and and the curriculum that's free, and transform your school, your town, into a place where there is a greater, um, uh, uh, what should I say, what should I say? it's kinder, it's more, it's, it's bully-free, and, and we're doing that in Charlotte, North Carolina, we're doing it in um, Rockford, Illinois, we're doing it uh, in, 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 in schools and in communities, and it, it all has to take place locally. You can't just have an edict from above and say this is going to happen. You've got to live it, you know, in an intense and personal way. And then, if you want to know what I am doing, uh, you know, I've got um, a, a very uninformative uh, Facebook page because I just haven't been able to get it together to deal with it. But soon, I will have more of a website. You can go to uh, Peter Paul and Mary uh, dot, I think it's dot com mm -hmm. and um, you'll see a lot of the things that I'm going to be doing posted there as well as what Noel Paul Stuckey is doing who is doing remarkable and wonderful work in a very parallel arena to the work that I'm doing as you might said, oh, that's to be expected. Well, it is, but it's quite wonderful. And uh, other than that, um, you know, uh, I, can, I can only say that uh, as, as I become more tech-connected, you'll have access to not just the things that I'm doing, but kinds of efforts that I think I would like to um, uh, share with you so that you will know about things that are happening. For instance, I just emailed about uh, 500 people with whom I'm in touch in this in a technology way, a, an, an extraordinary speech in, uh, in Iowa that was considering uh, whether to legalize same-sex marriage. And there's a young man who uh, is speaking to the legislature who is the son of a same-sex couple, and he is doing brilliantly, and he is saying, you, you cannot prevent our family from loving each other. You know, and here is a completely, you know, uh, heterosexual mm -hmm. leader who is, you know, and he's, and, and you, you say, you know, this is the most stunning example of uh, uh, speaking truth to power with passion and love and humanity that is so compelling. I, I wept throughout the entire thing. 
It was unbelievable. It's like that extraordinary uh, uh, appearance by Fred Rogers in, uh, before a subcommittee on, uh, on funding for a piece for a show where he was treated with this kind of incredible discipline and turned the situation around and got funding. And so, uh, there are also extraordinary... These are the kinds of things I want to share with people. You know, my life is, is one that's been extremely fortunate, and I'm aware of it. And, and I'm now able to, to do things that uh, I could not have done in years past mm -hmm. because I am at a, a, a stage where I really am receiving a lot of very, very wonderful information, and I can become a kind of a, a dissemination for it, and also being, living a, a sense of gratitude all the time, uh, you know, I can, I can step into the shoes of that interview, and uh, believe me, I'm not turning away from the challenges that surround us, as you can tell, but I am also very hopeful, very optimistic, because I think the forces that are, that are moving us towards a more sane, equitable, and sustainable world are growing with great rapidity, mm -hmm. and, and I could, could not be full and more uh, grateful to be a part of it and to talk about it with you. I mean, one of the, this is not to me work. This is a privilege. To just talk about things I care about and share these thoughts is, is a wonderful thing, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. You know, Peter, I feel very much the same way as I embarked on radio many years ago, as, and, and the many wonderful people such as yourself that I've met. Sometimes you thought to yourself, I didn't think life would be long enough that I would be having a conversation today with someone whom I grew up with singing songs like Puff the Magic Dragon and Blowing in the Wind. Peter, it's been a true pleasure to have you here on the program today. Thank you for joining us. You're truly so, my brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Go thank, well. thank you again. Our guest today, Peter Yarrow. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us here on the program. Be sure to visit us at our website. It is beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. We will have an archive on this show on our blog. Be sure to go there as well. Again, thank you for joining us. This is Beyond 50, and remember, live your day past halfway.